Welcome back. Uh, we're going to start our song service with number 534. Will your anchor hold? Number 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me.
how deep the Father's love for us. Please stand.
Good morning, everyone. I'm, I hope you guys are being as blessed as much as I am. Well, our, our last, very last session here today will be presented by Kim Kerr, entitled, Now What? But before I invite him up here, I'd like to invite Kendall Petty for prayer. Shall we kneel for prayer? Father in heaven, this morning we come before you grateful for your gift, grateful for the gift of your son and the gift of righteousness that you offer to us freely. Lord, you know we do not always appreciate what you have given us, but I pray that you would forgive us for this. And I pray that you would forgive each and every one of us for where we fall short with you. And I pray that you would Help us to see the ways that you are leading and that we can take hold of your righteousness right now and be numbered with with your people. And I pray that you would send your spirit to be with with this group in our last meeting, that that you would show us who you are in your righteousness. In your name we pray. Amen. There we go. Well, the weekend goes really fast, doesn't it? Just amazingly fast. So as we begin our last meeting uh, today of the session, I want to go back a little bit in history. Go back to the time of Luther. It's October 
in 1518. And Luther has been summoned to Augsburg in Germany. And there he is supposed to answer for his uh, teachings. And he's going to be asked to retract those teachings and his works and the things that he uh, has written. So the papacy is talking to him. There's a cardinal there that's addressing him and saying, you know, are these teachings yours? Yes, they are mine. You must retract them or the punishment will be visited upon you because you are a heretic. And so it, this kind of conversation went back and forth and finally uh, the, the papal legate said that if you don't uh, address us right now, he was asking for a little bit of time. If you don't address this right now, then you will not not be able to come back and address. And so Luther, and with his entourage, just left. They left and they escaped in the middle of the night and they kept on teaching. And so a document was issued condemning Luther, condemning his teachings and condemning his followers, that they were all heretical, everything that they were teaching was no good. And uh, then, again, a new document was issued that excommunicated Luther and cursed him and said he was cursed of heaven because the church had said he's not teaching what the Bible actually or what they, the church at the time was teaching. So here we see Luther talking to the cardinal. Great Controversy, page 143, Opposition is the lot of all whom God employs in present truth, especially applicable to their time. There was a present truth in the days of Luther, a truth at that time of special importance. There is a present truth for the church today. But truth is no more desired by the majority today than it was by the papists who opposed Luther. There is the same disposition to accept the theories and traditions of men instead of the word of God as in former ages. Those who present the truth for this time should not expect to be received with greater favor than were earlier reformers. The great controversy between truth and error, between Christ and Satan, is to increase in intensity to the close of this world's history. So what was Martin Luther preaching? Justification by faith in Christ alone. What was Jones preaching? Justification by faith in Christ alone. What was Wagner preaching? Justification by faith in Christ alone. Was their message accepted wholeheartedly at the time they were preaching this? No. And we've gotten a, uh, much of the background uh, over the course of these few meetings here. And so, no, there was opposition against the teaching that justification, our rightness with God, is by faith alone. That teaching was opposed, and it continues to be opposed. Those, or pardon me, there is not a point that needs to be dwelt upon more earnestly, repeated more frequently, or established more firmly in the minds of all than the impossibility of fallen man meriting anything by his own best good works. Salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. What's the last word? Alone. So was the, what Ellen White was preaching similar to the message that Jones, Wagner, and Luther was preaching? Salvation is by Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ alone. And that word, alone, those five letters was the cause of the Protestant Reformation. For 500 years, that has been the word that has been opposed by Rome over and over and over again. Go with me to uh, Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. The Council of Trent in the 1540s and 60s, 1560s rather, was organized to oppose this teaching. Revelation chapter 14, and we look here at verse 6. Revelation 14 and verse 6, there it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having, what does he have? 
the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell upon the earth to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. We've been listening about the history and about the message of righteousness by faith here. This is the everlasting gospel that this church was raised up to take to the world. The everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell upon the earth, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, everyone needs to hear about it. Saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to Him, the time has come, the hour of His judgment has come, worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. This was the foundational of the first angel's message that was preached in the 1840s. 1840 to 1844, uh, the Millerite movement really had its impetus, and these were the messages that were being preached. The everlasting gospel, the time of judgment has come, worship him that made heaven and earth. William Miller and his, uh, um, his cohorts thought that Jesus was supposed to come sometime between March 21st, 1843, and March 21st, 1844. That was the year 1843, the Jewish year 1843, which starts in the April, March, late April time frame. And so between March 21st, 1843 and March 21st, 1844, they thought that Jesus was supposed to come. But by March 21st, 1844, had Jesus come? He had not come. And now they were thrown into a bit of confusion and by April of 1844, they had read the parable of Matthew chapter 25, and they had seen that they were living in the tarrying time, a time in which the parable says that the bridegroom tarried. But they still continued to talk about the coming of Jesus, preaching that Jesus' coming was near, but they had kind of, they didn't know quite where they were because the time that they thought it would come between March 21st of 43 and 44, he had not come. And so they're kind of just in this time of waiting to see what's going to happen next. But during this time now, as they were trying to go to their churches and ask their churches to give them opportunity to present what they believed about the second coming of Christ, because it hadn't happened by March 21st, 1844, many of the pastors and churches said, we don't want to hear about this anymore. You can't talk about it in church. You can't talk about it in groups. You can't be a part of this church, basically, if you want to hold that teaching and that understanding. And so by May of 1844, many of the people were being turned out of their churches. They were loath to leave, but they wanted to hang on to the idea that Jesus was coming soon. And so in the summer of 1844, the next thing happened here. Revelation 14 and verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So by April 19th, 1844, they were in the tarrying time. By May, they were being cast out of their churches. And after May, during the summer of 1844, 50,000 people left their churches and became part of this Millerite movement that eventually went on to spawn the Seventh-day Adventist church. Why? Because Babylon had fallen. The churches were rejecting the first angel's message. They were saying, we don't want to hear about the second coming of Jesus Christ anymore. And so in the summer of 1844, the Millerites began preaching, Babylon is fallen. They've rejected this message. They've rejected the message of the everlasting gospel and the second coming of Jesus Christ. They experienced what was called a moral fall. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 232, when the churches spurned the counsel of God by rejecting the Advent message, what was the consequence? The Lord rejected them. The first angel was followed by a second, proclaiming, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. This message was understood by Adventists to be an announcement of the moral fall of the churches in consequence of their rejection of the first message. The proclamation, Babylon is fallen, was given in the summer of 1844, and as a result, about 50,000 withdrew from the churches. 
And so this is what took place. This is kind of the, the history here we're reading as we go on in uh, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. They experienced this moral fall. But the churches continued to slide as uh, the Sabbath uh, was introduced and other teachings were introduced. The churches continued to reject those teachings that were found here so in the scriptures. The Protestants had left Rome back in the time of the Reformation. Martin Luther eventually spawned what church? The Lutheran church, the Wesleys, John and Charles Wesley. What church rose up from their ministry? The Methodist church. And so these two great Protestant institutions had now, down in the 1840s, rejected the message of the Bible when they had embraced the message of the Bible back in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. And because of their fall, or because of their, their acceptance of the message back in the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, they left Rome. They parted with Rome. They said, we are going to stand on the Bible and the Bible alone. And they left the Church of Rome. But now that Babylon was fallen, now because of their rejection of the Scriptures, they're gradually sliding back where? They're going right back where they left. They're going right back to Rome. Back in October, on the anniversary of the nailing of the 95 Theses on Wittenberg Castle Church door. In October 31st of 1999, there was a document signed called the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. It had been something that had been in the works for a long time between the World Lutheran Foundation and the Roman Catholic Church. And they had come to an agreement on what they understood the doctrine of justification by faith. And they signed this agreement in October of 1999. And the ceremony took place in the same place, Augsburg, Germany, where Martin Luther had said, I will not recant. The ceremony took place in Augsburg, Germany on October 31st, 1999, Reformation Sunday, the anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 30, or pardon me, his 95 theses of protest to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. A few years later, the Methodists signed the same document. In 2006, we, the churches, joined together in the World Methodist Council, welcome this agreement with great joy. We declare that the common understanding of justification as it is outlined in the Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification corresponds to Methodist doctrine. Well, do you think that they were teaching the same things that they were teaching back at the time of the Reformation? No. Do you think Rome had changed their idea of what it meant to be justified by faith? No. They never change. So that's the Methodists and the Lutherans. And now we're finding out that it's happening to the Pentecostals as well. Uh, many of you recognize this gentleman on the far what is that? My far uh, uh, left, Tony Palmer. Your left? Is it your left? Well, I don't know. I'm a, yes. <laughs> uh, Tony Palmer there, and, if, and uh, this gentleman here is uh, Kenneth Copeland. If you know him, he's a, he's a, uh, a prominent, very prominent uh, Pentecostal. This is, um, what's his name, Judy? Robison, James Robison and his wife, Betty, and they have a program called Life Today on the uh, TBN networks, one of the most popular programs on there. And they went and had this meeting where Tony Palmer came and he said that the Protestant Reformation is over. 
that Catholics, Lutherans, Methodists, we all believe the same thing. And as Pentecostals, we believe in the gift of speaking in tongues. And so does the Catholic Church because they have the Catholic Charismatic Renewal Meeting. And so we're all just one big happy family. And the Spirit of God that speaks in tongues in you and the Spirit of God that speaks in tongues in me is the glue that ties us together. All of our doctrines, we need to forget about those. God will sort them out when we get to heaven. And so those individuals went over to the Vatican and they met with Pope Francis who had a, uh, a message via a, a cell phone video that Tony Palmer had recorded and brought over to this meeting in Texas. They went over there to the Vatican, but they didn't go empty-handed. They brought with them a document. And in that document, the Pentecostal leaders handed to Pope Francis and said, we believe the same thing that you believe. We believe the Council of Nicaea. We believe the same teaching on the doctrine of justification that you do. We will not proselytize your people. You will not proselytize ours. And we want to visibly join together during the time when the celebration of the Reformation takes place. When's that going to happen? October 31st, 2017. Just a few months away. This is what it's called, from conflict to communion, where the Lutheran Catholic common commemoration of the Reformation is in 20, uh, 2017. And you can't uh, read it up here possibly, but here's what it says. The Lutheran Roman Catholic Commission on Unity invites all Christians to study its report open-mindedly and critically and to walk along the paths toward full, visible unity of the church. Just a few weeks ago, there was another preparatory service to uh, move towards this one here. It was a Vatican conference called by the Vatican about Martin Luther. And here's what Pope Francis had to say. It's a document, a printed document, not just something he verbalized, but an actual document. March 31st, 2017. And here's what Pope Francis writes. I confess that my first response to this praiseworthy initiative of the Pontifical Committee for Historical Sciences was one of gratitude to God together with a certain what? Surprise. Together with a certain surprise since not long ago a meeting like this would have been unthinkable. Here we are. The Catholic Commission calling something about Martin Luther, the Lutherans joining, and Pope Francis is expressing a little bit of surprise that something like this is really happening. But God told us in the great controversy that it would happen. Page 566. Protestants have tampered with and patronized popery. They have made concessions, compromises and concessions, which papists themselves are what? Surprised. Surprised to see and fail to understand. Pope Francis goes on. All of us are well aware that the past cannot be changed. Yet today, after 50 years of ecumenical dialogue between Catholics and Protestants, it is possible to engage in a purification of memory. Let's not remember the past, because it's not very flattering to us Catholics. Let's not remember, let's purify our memory of the Protestant Reformation and what actually took place there. So we can't change the past, but we can purge our memory of it. Pope Francis still speaking. This is not to undertake an impractical, impractical correction of all that happened 500 years ago, but rather to tell the history differently. Free of any lingering trace of the resentment over past injuries that has distorted our view of one another. 
So let's just rewrite history. Let's purge our memory. And let's visibly join together. The Reformation is over. And so we're going to commemorate it on October 31st, 24. Uh, this was happened in um, what he said in 2014 of what's going to happen in 2017. In 2017, Lutheran and Catholic Christians commemorate together the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. On this occasion... Lutherans and Catholics will, for the first time, have opportunity to keep one and the same global ecumenical commemoration, not in the form of a triumphalist celebration, but rather to confess our, our what? Our common faith. Now, have you, does that ring any bells for you if you've read The Great Controversy? When the leading churches of the United States unite upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institution, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy and the infliction of civil penalties upon dissenters will inevitably result. And so what do we see happening? Methodists, Lutherans, Pentecostals, wanting to unite with the Church of Rome on common beliefs. Common beliefs. And we know when that these things happen that, according to Great Controversy, page 445, that civil penalties will end for uh, their institutions will eventually result. And similar things were happening back in what year? 1888. At the time, the message of righteousness by faith was going forward. In Congress were bills wanting to pass Sunday law. The, Bear, the Blair Bill in 1888, the Breckenridge Bill in 1889. These were attempted to pass through Congress that would have made Sunday a national day of rest. At the same time, there was a great ecumenical movement taking place in which Protestants and Catholics were seeking to join together on common beliefs, common points of doctrine. The same things are happening today. The exact same things, and though we know, so we know that Sunday is looming, it can't be very far away. So what's the consensus? What's the consensus in this document? This is paragraph 40. The understanding of the doctrine of justification set forth in this declaration shows that a consensus in basic truths of the doctrine of justica justification exists between who? Lutherans and Catholics. Thus, the doctrinal condemnations of the 16th century, insofar as they relate to the doctrine of justification, appear in a new light. The teaching of the Lutheran churches presented in this declaration does not fall under the condemnations from the Council of Trent. And the condemnations in the Lutheran confessions do not apply to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church presented in this declaration. So here you have the, Protest the, uh, the Council of Trent was convened to discredit and to destroy the Protestant Reformation. They did not believe the same. Luther said justification by faith was by faith alone. And the church said, no, it's by faith and what else? Works. And that was the, um, the fight for hundreds of years. But now, the Council of Trent saying, well, in this document, we don't have that issue anymore. And the sad thing is that the Lutherans are not condemning the teachings of justification by faith as held by the Church of Rome. So what are some of the, what are some of the teachings in this document? And this is the central uh, core here of that document. Thank you. 
by grace alone, in faith in Christ's saving work, and not because of any merit on our part, we are accepted by God and receive the Holy Spirit who renews our hearts while equipping and calling us to good works. Now, when you look at this, is there anything really wrong with this statement? Not a trick question. There's really nothing wrong with this statement. And if you compare the spirit of prophecy and put, put that together, compare the Bible, there's really nothing wrong with this statement. And it's the core of this document, the Declaration of Justification by Faith or the Joint Declaration of Justification by Faith. It sounds really, really good until you begin reading the rest of the document that defines the terms of this statement. And so, point 25. By the action of the Holy Spirit, when? In baptism, they are granted the gift of salvation. So when do you get the gift of salvation? When you're baptized. Point 27. Persons are justified through what? Baptism. But what does my Bible say? I'm justified by faith. I'm not justified by baptism. I'm justified by faith. Verse 30, or, uh, point 30 here. Catholics hold that the grace of Jesus Christ imparted, when's it imparted? When do we get grace? In baptism, when we're baptized. In other words, we have to do some work before we can receive grace. We have to do some work before we can be justified. The Bible tells us, though, we come to Christ just as we are, and when we ask for His forgiveness, He forgives us, and by grace are ye saved. And so that's what's in the document, that when the, when the church says we are justified by faith, it means we're justified by baptism, through baptism, the sacrament of the church, administered by the church, and therefore the church is granting the grace and the justification. It's not coming from God. It's coming from the church. And that's the difference between what Martin Luther taught and what the uh, Church of Rome taught. Okay, let's go to the book of Ephesians, please. Ephesians chapter 2, here we find out what the Bible actually says. Justification does not come through baptism. In fact, uh, the Church of Rome calls it the instrumental cause, that baptism is the instrumental cause of justification. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace... Are ye saved through, it doesn't say through baptism, does it? Through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If it's by works, then we can boast about it. Look what I've accomplished. Therefore, God justifies me because what I did. If it's not of works, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, down towards the, the end of the chapter there, verse 28, as Paul has gone through this chapter and told us how justification is accepted through the death of Jesus Christ, through faith in His blood, etc., where God declares His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28 says, Therefore, as he lists all his, his points, he's bringing things to a conclusion now, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without or apart from the deeds of the law. Justification is by faith, it is not by baptism. And again, Catholics believe that it's the sacrament of baptism administered by the church that brings justification. Grace comes through this sacrament. 
It's a vehicle of the church rather than the vehicle of God. It's contrary to the scriptures. The scriptures say we're justified by faith and that salvation is a free gift from God. Well, what about works then? What does, uh, what does this document say about works? Point 38. When Catholics affirm the meritorious character of good works, they wish to say that the biblical witness, so where do they want to, you to believe they're getting this from? I want you to believe they're getting it from the Bible. They wish to say that the, according to the biblical witness, a reward in heaven is promised to these works. And what kind of works do they say they are? Meritorious works. Works that deserve a reward. Works that deserve a reward. Now let's look a little bit deeper in what they teach in their catechism. This is the newest catechism that came out. Pope John Paul II commissioned this one. Article 2010 in this book. Since the initiative belongs to God in the order of grace, no one can merit... What kind of grace does it say? The initial grace of forgiveness and justification at the beginning of conversion. Now, they say it comes through baptism. When does the Catholic Church want you to be baptized? When you are like barely out of the womb, you know, just a few days old, a few weeks old, they want you to be baptized right then. From that point, they say, you are justified. So nobody can merit that initial justification. But notice as we read on, what does it say? Moved by the Holy Spirit and by charity, we can then, what? Merit for ourselves and for others. I could be so good that I could get merit not just for myself but for you. And that's the whole basis of the saints. That's why they pray to Joseph and Mary and all the rest to get grace from them because they lived such holy lives. Moved by the Spirit of the Holy Spirit and charity, we can then for ourselves and for others Grace is needed for our sanctification, for the increase of grace and charity, and for the attainment of eternal life. Even temporal goods like health and friendship can be merited in accordance with God's wisdom. These graces and goods are the object of Christian prayer. Well, do we merit anything because of our good works? Absolutely not over the page here to chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and we look at verse 1. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. There it says, What shall we say then, that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. This is the same thing that he says in Ephesians chapter 2. By grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So he says the same thing here. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him, or counted unto him, for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. Something that God owes me because those works are meritorious and therefore I deserve the reward that God is going to give me. The Bible does not teach that. The Bible does not teach that works are meritorious. Not to him that now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But what about Abraham? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. If it's by works, a reward is owed to us. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies... Who does he, who does he justify? the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And righteousness brings the reward that God promises. Down there in verse 13, for the promise 
that, we, that he should be heir of the world was to Abraham, was not to Abraham, pardon me, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So when God promised Abraham that he could have any place that his foot touched, that was his. When he walked from Haran down through the land of Israel, every place that the sole of your feet touches is yours the land of Canaan that God was going to give him, the land flowing with milk and honey. It was promised to him. But it wasn't just the land of Canaan as we read here. It was the whole world that he would inherit. The promise that he should be heir of the world. And again, if you are an heir, it's a gift. Isn't that right? He's not working for this. An heir is being given an inheritance. It's a gift upon the death of the one who wrote the will. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith, the, righteous, the only righteousness that the law accepts. And what was Abraham promised? What was Abraham looking for? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8 says, For by faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. Verse 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Were they looking only to the land of Canaan? No, they were looking to that heavenly country. They were looking to that glorious new Jerusalem. They were looking by faith not just to here in this world, but put the next world. They were looking after the thousand years when God would repopulate the world that would uh, be in righteousness. Verse 14. For if they, which are, uh, this is uh, uh, now back in Romans chapter 4. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. So how did Abraham receive the promise? He received it by faith. But, it's com but if it comes through the law, if it comes through works, if we're going to be rewarded for what we've done, faith is made what? Void. Faith is made of no effect. And the promise made of none effect. So both the faith and the promise are worthless. If, if we're heirs by works, if the inheritance is by works, if heaven is by works, faith and the promise are worthless. But justification in heaven is what? It's a gift. It's a gift from God. By grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. And we're rewarded with that gift because God is good. And he rewards us as if we really merited what he's giving us. Selected Messages, book 1, page 200. In his divine arrangement, through his unmerited favor, the Lord has ordained that good works shall be rewarded. We are accepted through Christ's merit. What's the next word? Alone. And the acts of mercy, here's our works now, the acts of mercy, the deeds of charity, which we perform are fruit of faith. And they become a blessing to us, for men are to be rewarded according to their works. It is the fragrance of the merit of Christ that makes our good works acceptable to God. And it is grace that enables us to do the works for which he rewards us. Our works in and of themselves shall have much. How much merit? None. No merit. God doesn't reward us because we've been good, so to speak. Our works in and of themselves have no merit. The reason that our good works are acceptable to God, it says here, is because of the merit of Jesus Christ, not because of our goodness. 
Our works have, in and of themselves have no merit. When we have done all that it is possible for us to do, we are to count ourselves as unprofitable servants. We deserve no thanks from God. We have only done that which it was our duty to do, and our works could not have been performed in the strength of our own sinful natures. And so it's one or the other. It's either by faith or it's by works. But it's not a combination of both. It can't be. Because if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it's by works, then it's no more of grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. But it can't be a combination. It can't be a combination. It's got to be one or the other. And Paul dealt with this very question of people who were trying to join justification by faith plus works. He met that argument. Go with me to uh, the book of Galatians and let's take a look there. Galatians chapter 3. Into the church at the time, there were believers, Pharisees who believed, Jews who believed, they, were, they were, uh, uh, believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but at the same time, they were making other stipulations that in order to be considered the seed of Abraham, in order to be considered uh, safe to save and, and worthy to be saved, that you had to keep the law of Moses. You had to be circumcised and you had to keep the law of Moses or the feast days. And Paul's saying, no, no, this is not the way it is. So here, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians. Can you imagine writing that to the church? O oh, foolish Galatians. Who hath bewitched you? Who has pulled the wool over your eyes? Who has, who has deceived you? Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Don't you realize that your salvation is based on the death of Jesus Christ? Don't you realize that it's the blood of Jesus that washes away your sins? That it's the righteous, holy life of Jesus Christ that gives you the uh, acceptance with God? You've had, before your eyes, Jesus Christ has evidently been set forth, crucified among you. You know how to be saved. This only, what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did the Spirit of God come into your life? Was it because you did certain things that the Spirit came into your life? Or was it because you said, God, I'm impossible for me to do this unless you fill me with your Spirit? How did it happen? It wasn't by works. It was by faith. It was by faith. And so Paul is writing here. He says, somebody's gotten to you. Who? Who has bewitched you? And then in verse 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by what? By the flesh. And so the Galatians had bought into this idea. They had begun in the Spirit. They had received the Spirit by faith. But now they are seeking perfection through the works of the law. Justification then to them was not faith in Christ alone, but faith and the works of the law. They were saved not by Christ alone, but by faith and something else. Being a Christian was not by faith, but with something else added. They would begin the Christian life by faith, but they would complete the Christian life by works. They begun in the Spirit, but they were now made perfect or complete by works, by the flesh. But Paul wrote to the Galatians to correct this error that justification, salvation was by faith alone. Go over to chapter 5. We've looked at this before, but let's look at it again. Chapter 5 says, Stand fast. Stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free 
and be not entangled again with this yoke of bondage. The yoke of bondage being the works for salvation, the works for righteousness, circumcision in their case here. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if you be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If works bring righteousness, if works bring salvation, then Christ is worthless to you because it's all or nothing. It's one or the other. It's not a combination of both. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised. If you're using that circumcision to gain the grace of God, gain the favor of God, if you're using those works to try and earn somehow the favor of God that you're a debtor to do, how much of the law? All of it. But you can't do all of it because righteousness is from your birth to your death and everybody has sinned. And so it's, it, it's impossible for you to do the whole law over your entire life because you've already sinned and your future obedience is not going to make up for the past transgressions. You can't plug up the holes in your bowl. God is only looking for a bowl that's never had any holes. Christ, in verse 4, is become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. If you want to be justified by works, if you want to be justified through obedience, again, Christ becomes worthless to you. You are outside of grace. You are on your own. You've fallen away from grace. But friends, that's the doctrine of Rome. The doctrine of Rome is that after grace, you must do something to merit the favor of God. We look again here at the catechism. Absolution, now this is the priest saying, I absolve you of your sins. I forgive you of your sins. Absolution takes away sin, does it? No. But it does not remedy all the disorders that sin has caused. Raised up from sin, the sinner must still recover his full spiritual health by doing something more to make amends for sins. So in other words, when the priest absolves you of your sin, it's like God saying, I forgive you of your sin, but that's not good enough. You've still got to do something to make amends for your sins. He must make satisfaction for or expiate his sins. This satisfaction is also called, what's that word? Penance. And when, as I grew up as a Catholic, and I would grow, go to Catholic church and I would go into the confessional and the priest would slide back that little door and I'd say, you know, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this. And the priest would say, I absolve you of your sins and he'd make the sign of the cross and I'd be forgiven my sins. But then what did I have to do? Penance. I had to get out of that little confessional box. I had to go down to the front of the church. I had to kneel in front of the altar and I'd have to say so many prayers. And so it was a combination of what God was supposed to be doing plus what I had to do. That's the teaching of the Church of Rome. And that's the teaching that Lutherans, Methodists, and Pentecostals are buying into. Let the subject be made distinct and plain that it is not possible to affect anything in our standing before God or in the gift of God to us through creature merit. Should faith and works purchase the gift of salvation for anyone, then the Creator is un under obligation to the creature. Here is an opportunity for falsehood to be accepted as truth. If any man can merit salvation by anything he can do, then he is in the same position as the Catholic to do penance 
for his sins. Salvation then is partly of debt to be earned as wages. If man cannot, by any of his good works, merit salvation, then it must be wholly of grace. Received by man as a sinner because he be- receives and believes in Jesus. It is wholly a free gift. Justification by faith is placed beyond controversy and all this controversy is ended as soon as the matter is settled that the merits of fallen man and his good works can never procure for him eternal life. Hallelujah, right? Praise the Lord. It's a gift. And friends, Jesus suffered and died on Calvary's cross to be able to give us that gift. And he's still suffering because we're down here fooling around. And so the idea that Jesus does part and you do part, it's just not in the scriptures. The righteousness of Christ is our only hope. Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. Yes, there's cooperation. But there's no merit in it. God rewards us because He's good. Verse 5. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. What's the hope of righteousness by faith? Eternal life. Eternal life. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith that works by love. It's not faith and works. It's faith that works. That's a big difference. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 9. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, and it goes on to say, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, etc. This, what warning is this talking about? It's talking about the mark of the beast, isn't it? It's talking about the last day issue that you and I are going to have to face. It's warning here not to take the the, uh, uh, mark of the beast or worship his image. And it's going to be fought over righteousness by faith. It's going to be fought over righteousness by faith versus righteousness by works. How? Verse 12. Verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? They keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The righteousness by faith is going to be manifest in keeping how many of the commandments of God? All the commandments of God. It's going to be manifest in keeping all the commandments of God. Righteousness by works is going to be manifested by keeping the commandments of men. And so righteousness by faith and righteousness by works are going to be the focal point at the end of time. Righteousness by faith will be seen as keeping all the commandments of God, but righteousness by works is going to be keeping the commandments of men. And the two manifestations of that is going to be the Sabbath and Sunday. Righteousness by faith and righteousness by works. And God tells us that the Sabbath is an evidence of... Pardon me. God tells us that the Sabbath is evidence of righteousness by faith. 20 here. And verse 12. Moreover, I also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that does what? Sanctifies them. It's a manifestation 
that God is transforming our lives because we believe in Christ, our only Savior. And so the Sabbath here is showing that God is sanctifying His people. Keeping the Sabbath is not to earn brownie points to gain entrance into heaven. Keeping the Sabbath is an evidence of manifestations that you are righteous by faith. Because it's manifest in keeping all the commandments of God. Where believing in Sunday is a manifestation that I'm righteous in and of my own self, my own works, and I'm going to do what man tells me to do. And that's the issue that's being fought. The underlying cause of it all is righteousness by faith or righteousness by works. Sunday is the fruit that comes forth from Satan. Sabbath is the fruit that comes forth from God. God has opened to us our strength. And we need to know something about it. And be prepared for what? The time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. But here is our strength. What is it? Christ, our righteousness. It's not my ability or my capabilities. It's the righteousness of Christ. And when I accept Him, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes into my life. He fills my life. That's my strength, the righteousness of Jesus. It's not my strength. And so I can go uh, uh, towards the time of trouble and not... Fear, because God is with you. The time of test is upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun. We've heard that before, haven't we? Already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of His righteousness, which He imputes to the repentant sinner. What's going to get you through the time of trouble? Christ and His righteousness. That's where our strength is. It's not of ourselves. Because when we look at ourselves, we don't see much strength there. But when we look at Christ, we see all strength. All power in heaven and earth is given unto me. Go ye therefore into all the world. And so as we close out, have you appropriated the gift of the righteousness of Christ? Do you know that Christ is your Savior? Do you know that He not only died for the sins of the world, but He died for you and your sins? Have you accepted that death on your behalf as an atonement for your sins? Have you allowed and believed the promise of God that I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness? Do you believe the promise of I will give you a new heart and I will put my spirit within you. If you don't have that experience, friend, you need to get that experience. And you can have it when? Right now. So let us kneel and pray for that experience, shall we? Father in heaven, same conditions that were happening around 1888 we see happening today. The same events that were taking place are happening today. We know that Jesus is soon to come. And we're told that our strength to face the future unafraid is found in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Father, there may be some of us here who don't have that experience who have not confessed their sins and accept Jesus as their only hope of salvation. If there's someone here today and God knows who you are and He's looking tenderly at your heart right now saying, Dear child, dear son, dear daughter, give me your heart. Give me your life. Let me change you. Let me wash you. 
Let me transform your life. Let me fill you with my spirit. I want to make you a burning, shining light. Will you let me? Will you open that door and let me in today? Will you? Won't you say yes to Jesus Christ at this moment? That he who hung on Calvary's cross for you might come and dwell in you? Say yes to Jesus now. What little things in this world can we hang on to that is worth more than Christ? Dear God, we thank you for your love and your forgiveness. And we pray that we might day by day behold Christ and him crucified. And as we behold him, we know we'll be changed from glory to glory into the same image. And we just put all of our hope, we lean all of our weight, we trust wholly to the merits of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you for being with us. Please go with us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.